you're not alone, <laughs> not knowing what psychomimicry is about, but I'll tell you about it. So I'm going to be talking about the intersection of psychology and digital design and introduce the topic of psychomimicry. But before digging into psychomimicry, I'd like to tell you a little about its inception, where it came from. So has anybody heard of biomimicry? A couple of head nods. So biomimicry is basically looking to nature for inspiration for design or solving human problems and innovation. And some examples of that is looking at the lotus flower when designing water repellent fabrics. Or looking at birds to make high speed trains run more quietly. Or looking at termites or termite nests when designing ventilation systems for large buildings. So biomimicry was kind of popularized in the late 90s. And I learned about it a couple of years ago through a colleague of mine, Jane Fulton Surrey. And I was really, really inspired when I heard about it. And I work as an interaction designer. I've been working for almost five years. But I have a background in psychology. So I immediately started thinking about how psychology could inspire digital design in, in, in a similar way. So I ended up kind of making my own version of biomimicry, which I call psychomimicry, which is about looking at the human mind for inspiration when we're trying to improve our digital experience. So why do I think psychomimicry is relevant or can help us? Well, the internet continues to play a really big role in our lives, but how are we really set up to handle this increasingly complex digital world that we're exposed to. Information overload is a term often used when we talk about the internet. But you could argue that the information we're exposed to online is a mere fraction of what we're exposed to in the physical world. I mean, when we're online, we're looking at a single web page, mainly using a single sense, namely our vision. Whereas now in the real physical world here right now, we're somehow managing to process information and stimuli from s multiple senses simultaneously. So I started asking myself if the problem of information overload is really about the amount of information, or is it more about the inadequate digital tools that we have at our disposal, disposal today? So this is kind of where psychomimicry, psychomimicry comes into the picture. So can models and theories about how the human mind works help us to create better tools in, in our digital world? I started to do some simple design exercises to kind of explore this area, and I'll share three of them with you today. So the, the two first ones are going to be about memory. And this first one is about short-term memory, or working memory, as it's often called today. Um, so short-term memory allows us to keep a limited amount of information active in our mind, kind of the forefront in our, in our mind, and we can work with it here and now. But it's limited in the sense that it is limited in, in time. So if it, maybe up to a minute, we can keep something in our short-term memory. And then we have to kind of store it back in our long-term memory, or it's lost. And it's also limited in the sense that it's, you can only hold so much information. So one way, it's, so researchers test, test the capacity of the short-term memory is to pre present a string of numbers like this to, to someone like you, and then take it away, and then ask you to, to recite it back. And they found that, you know, on average, people are able to keep about seven of these in their mind at, you know, at a single point. But more recent research have actually shown that the real number is more like five items that you can keep in your short-term memory. Um, so how is it that we're able to keep these seven in our mind? So what the brain actually does is combining smaller pieces of elements, so numbers in this case, and combining them into slightly larger pieces of information and kind of um, thereby kind of making it a little more efficient. So this process is called chunking. So by chunking the numbers, it's a little bit more easy to remember. Obviously, you can't chunk into two large items because then it's kind of hard to remember that as well. 
So I, I always thought of tabs in modern browsers kind of like an online version of our, of our digital short-term memory. Um, and it's very similar in the sense that it keeps kind of our active web pages readily available and accessible to us. I don't know about you, but I, I tend to go way beyond seven tabs. I mean, I don't want to even disclose how many I, I have open. Uh, but it can come kind of hard to manage. It becomes a bit unruly at certain points. So what if we would apply the idea of chunking to tabs? So maybe these tabs on the right could be a couple of shoes. I'm trying to decide which ones to buy. You know, and the three on the left might be three articles I found when I was looking for, for something through work. So the second example is more about long-term memory. So I think a lot of us already today think of Google as kind of an extended memory, our extended memory. And there's some statistics that show that up to 40% of all online searches today are actually people trying to refind information they've already seen once, at least once. So it's, it's quite a significant uh, use case. So we have some tools already available to us today. We have s really great services like Pinterest or Evernote. But they are more for things that are really save-worthy. You know, you really want to kind of curate that. And there's also a little bit of work to be done there to, to log it or categorize it or tag it. But there's a whole lot of other information that you know, it's, would be too cumbersome to save and, and categorize in that way. And I often find myself you know, trying to find that quirky video, the funny one that somebody showed me two months ago, and now I want to show it to my friend, Annika. Um, or I might have read a headline of an article and kind of decided not to read it, but then you know, a conversation makes it relevant a couple of days later and try to, to find it again. And there's some tools there that help us as well, which one is um, the blue uh, links that turn pu purple in search engines, so you can kind of distinguish the ones you've clicked on. That's definitely helpful. And we also have the history function, where you can go and kind of get a chronological or record of all the websites you visited. Mm -hmm. And I might find my quirky video there on January 2nd, 3.45 p.m. But that's not really how the mind works. We're, we're not kind of organizing you know, in that chronological perfect order. Nowadays, there are also search functions within the history functions that makes it a little more useful. But the way the information is presented there is very different from the way it's presented in, in the normal search, the Google normal search. So I find a lot of people don't really use the history function. They, they still struggle with using the normal Google search to find something, they, they, or refine something they want to find. So in the physical world, I mean, we switch between experiencing the here and now, searching and learning new things, and to memory and recalling a fact or, or a previous incident. We kind of go between the two throughout the day. So could it be as simple as just adding a refine button to complement the search button that we already have? So that if you search, if you use the search button, you would search the entire web. And if you use the refine button, you would, in essence, kind of search your online memory. So the last example is more about communication. So when we talk face to face to somebody, there's a lot of information in the nonverbal. We have body posture or body language facial expressions, or tone of voice, or, or, or volume of voice. And obviously we can also see the person we're talking to and kind of gauge whether that person is you know, you know, understanding what we're saying and we can kind of adjust our communication accordingly. But online we often don't have that luxury. and A lot of times we're dealing with written communication. And we're also dealing often with a, a wide audience. And I found this in my work, especially working on more complex, complex topics, such as you know, financial services or, or in banking, where some people know a lot. I mean, they might even know more than some of the experts. And others struggle to understand some of the basic concepts they were trying to convey. And there are some, some solutions I've seen today. One, which is there are certain keywords that are clickable and kind of brings up a pop-up with the dictionary description of, of 
that term. But the problem with that is it kind of takes the reader a little bit out of the flow of reading. And the other problem is that uh, they're often written in kind of a generic way. Which, and it can sometimes be hard to understand how it applies in this certain context, where I'm, you know, how it's being used, where I'm reading it. So I mocked up this kind of video prototype, which is similar in that you can also click on certain keywords. But instead of a pop-up, they kind of open in place and insert the explanation in line. So that the user can kind of gauge and, and signal almost when, when, the, when he or she needs a little more support. But it has the benefit of it, it keeps the reader in the flow. And also it's, it's written and constructed in such a way that it's contextual. So to wrap up, um, Psychomimicry is really in its infancy, and you guys are <laughs> among the first to ever hear about it. Uh, but I, I, I'm really excited about it, and I, I, I do think that there's a lot in psychology that we can learn, and I think it can be a great resource for kind of the future of digital design and kind of taking us forward. So yeah, thank you so much.